Welcome to another exciting project management lecture. Today we are going to talk about change orders. Last time we talked about cost control and how to track our costs. Change orders are a big part of cost control. Change, uh, changes occur on every project. They can be small changes such as clarifications to drawings or specifications, or they can be large things and change major aspects of a project. Let me give you an example of a project that was really affected by change orders. There is no question that things never quite turn out the way that you anticipate in any construction project. When the, when the 1976 Summer Olympics were awarded to Montreal, Canada, plans were already moving ahead for the Olympic venues and, es and especially the main stadium pictured below. In this case, if, some, if something could go wrong, it did. The original budget for all of the venues would, was about $240 million. The design and specifications were late getting out to bid. Because they were so late, many contractors would only work on a time plus material. Because they, um, basis. The design was new and included materials and techniques that had not been done before, and this caused a major productivity problem. There was a labor strike while there were already a shortage of labor and skilled trades in the region. The drawings were all in metric measurements and many of the sub subcontractors came from the United States and could not read the drawings. The drawings had to be redone in feet and inches. It was cold and bitter the winter just before the Olympics. The temporary tenting and heating costs during that winter exceeded $40,000 per day. Because of the late start, contractors were wor working on top of one another. At one point, there were there were 80 tower cranes in the operate on in operation on the stadium at one time. Montreal was not going to be embarrassed in front of the world. They finished the venues on time and the games went forward. Unfortunately, the final price tag was a staggering 1.3 billion dollars. There were definitely some changes in claims on this project. Okay, so we're gonna continue on with change orders here. Um, hopefully that was a good introduction for you. Um, that's Cougar, that's who I always talk about in class. Um, he kind of decided to come in and help me today. Um, but changes happen on almost every project and you just gotta get used to it. Um, if you're worried about, well, this stresses you out, well, it will, but it also happens. And so you just kind of be a, have to be able to roll with the punches. And so when changes happen, you need to understand the process of how changes happen. And so some changes can be made at no cost, um, pretty easy. So if I'm deciding I want to move a door from one side of the room to another side of the room and the walls are not built yet, um, that's simple. That's instructions from the architect that come in and you can just say change this door. You get the documentation and there's no cost change. Uh, there was no material changes, no extra work. And so that can be a no cost change order. Others can affect um, costs and schedule. And these changes are called change orders. And so um, it's really just a settlement and a change in the contract. So anytime that the scope changes in a contract, uh, you'll end up having a change order. And so the best price for projects is given during the bidding process, during when there's competition and people are trying to win the job. That's when you're going to get the best price for an owner. Um, it's not through change orders. Uh, that's for sure. Change orders are very expensive part of the process. It's kind of like if any of you like working on cars, if you tried to build a car from car parts that you buy at the auto store, um, it would end up costing you probably five or 10 times the amount than just buying a normal car that was built and assembled the way that it came off of the factory floor. And so the same thing kind of holds true with projects and change orders. Um, you don't want to build a project from change orders um, because the cost would be much higher. Um, change orders also shouldn't be a way that contractors make huge profits. Sometimes, especially on like a lump sum bid, contractors will go in with a low price and then you get contractors who 
are looking for every single thing that the architect missed or that there's no information on and they just mark it up and do their change orders and so you've probably seen that picture of the change order yacht um, where you have a little dinghy hanging off the back of this big yacht the little dinghy says uh, original contract and then the big boat says change order um, that's kind of how contractors have done work and that's not always an ethical thing that doesn't win you a lot of friends and it doesn't help you get repeat work either and so um, the way we look at change orders is the cost is higher because usually change order work is done quickly um, it's usually the work's already done and then the changes need to be made on the fly um, you're trying to rush order materials to get things done and changed. And so you need to kind of look at that and say, um, this can be an expensive process. And so the best price is going to come up front. Um, usually in terms of markup for change orders, you're going to get a specified markup in the contract. Uh, most of the time it's 10%. It could be different, uh, but that 10% markup is what you get to include which includes your management fee and any profit and overhead would be included in that for you as well and so you want to make sure you're looking at the bid um, bidding documents and what the contract says to price your change orders correctly and so the change order process needs to be viewed as a way for the owner to make changes uh, to pay for things left out that need to be put in or that they desire to change if they want to move a window or add a scope of work. Um, that's an opportunity to do that, but it's not for the contractor to make unreasonable profits. And so there's lots of changes that can happen on a project. And so I'm going to kind of go over here and write a couple of them. Let me share my screen with you. Mm -hmm. here and so if I've got this I'm going to go to draw and I'm just going to start writing here so we've got different ways that um, change orders can happen and so one of those changes is what we call an ASI which is an architectural supplemental instruction um, an ASI should be a zero dollar change order. It's not always the case, but that's technically what it should be. It should just be some supplemental instructions from the architect um, clarifying something or um, in our door case, if we're moving it from one side of the room to another, the architect could issue an ASI if the wall had not been framed yet. Um, then that would be a no cost change. So that's no cost change here. And so that's an ASI. Another way that a change order happens is a uh, proposal request. Or a PR, which just Essentially, the architect sends out an information or a request, a proposal request, asking the contractor to price this change. Okay, so they're asking, they're not necessarily telling you to do the work, but it's more of a question saying, well, how much would it cost if we decided to change this? Um, let's say they decided to add a window into our classroom in B66. They might say, what would be a proposal for this? Let, just give me a number so then we can make a decision. Um, another one would be a change order request. Which is a COR. Um, again, that's a price this change. So they're just asking you to do that. Um, now, a change directive is a CD or a construction change directive is pretty much the owner telling you do the work. 
um, do the work and get me the cost after. Um, you might give them a rough order of magnitude um, for how much the change order is going to be. They might say, go ahead and do it or do it on a time and material basis. Um, I'll pay you for this work. Get it done now. Um, get it ordered. Get it done. I've made up my mind. You're going to go through this. You need to make sure you get this in writing and make sure that you've given some kind of rough order of magnitude so that they have an idea of what that change order might be costing you. Um, and so those are different ways that change orders are initiated on projects. Um, usually they come through the architect um, by direction of the owner or from the architect if they've missed something. And sometimes it can come from an RFI. Um, your subcontractor or you as a general contractor might look at something and say, hey, we're missing some information. You go ask the RFI and all of a sudden you've got information back from the architect saying, yes, we need to have a change order. And so uh, as we go up here, so you might look at if a change order is initiated, by the contractor, then you have, you know, the GC sends an RFI, and then that goes to the architect, um, and then the architect goes to the owner in some cases and looks at it and says, oh, should we do this? Um, and then the architect might say, oh, we've got a problem. So one ex exercise that I usually do in class um, is I give everybody, this is the one class that I would let everyone use their computers in, um, computers or phone, and I break you up into different roles. And so you might, some of you might have been the general contractor or the architect or the owner or a mechanical engineer or a subcontractor or a supplier. And so with all of these different roles, um, I give you each other's emails and you're all broken into groups and you go through the change order process. And so the process of that change order is the subcontractor comes through and they're building a bathroom in this office building and they discover that the ceilings of the bathroom are too low um, for the bathroom fans that were specified. And so the subcontractor takes that RFI and sends it to the general contractor and says, hey, the specified ceiling fans are too tall for the ceiling heights that we have. And the ceilings have already been installed. And so then the question becomes, what do we do? Um, and so the subcontractor says, what would you like us to do? And so then the general contractor goes to the architect and says, hey, listen, we have a problem. The bathroom fans are too tall for the ceilings. Um, we need to either lower the ceilings or we need to find a different fan. So then the architect uh, lets the owner know, and the owner says, well, let's, let's go ahead and price this out. Let's look at our different options. And so the architect goes to the mechanical engineer and asks what other options are there. The mechanical engineer says, well, there's a lower profile fan that you can get, but there's gonna be some costs associated with that. And so the architect sends back the request for change order or proposal request to the contractor and says, how much is this going to cost? Um, let's look at both options. How much is it going to cost? And the architect proposes lower fans or reduce the ceiling. So the contractor prices up both options. Um, and it goes through you know, you as students, if you were in this scenario, you would be emailing back and forth. So some of you wouldn't even get an email the whole time you're sitting in class because you might be a supplier and these emails are going back and forth from the subcontractor to the general contractor to the architect and then to the owner and the mechanical engineer and then back to the architect and then back to the 
general contractor and then finally the general contractor sends back to the subcontractor a request for quote for the pricing well then the subcontractor has to send an email to the supplier that says hey how much would it be to change these bathroom fans and the supplier has a price that they've got and they have to mark it up to make their profit and then the subcontractor takes it and they mark it up to make their profit and then they send it back to the general contractor and they mark it up to make their profit and then they send that back to the architect um, for and the owner has to make the decision whether they want to spend the money to lower the ceilings or go through and um, change all the bathroom fans to the lower profile fans now some of the things that you don't always think about is well what if the supplier doesn't take back the original fans well that could add to the cost uh, because now who owns those fans that are not going to be used in the project well the owner uses owns those fans they've paid for them and so now they've had to pay for two fans which becomes a very expensive thing or in some cases the suppliers might take back the original fans, um, but they might charge a restocking fee. So there's an extra cost there. And so kind of as you go through this whole process, you realize that the communication process of the change order takes a long time. Um, I try and have you guys go through that whole experience in class while I'm lecturing, um, which gets very complicated for some because they're sitting there looking for emails and not really paying attention to the lecture and, but you you kind of simulate what goes on because you're waiting for emails from people just like you are in the industry sometimes your architect goes on vacation and you're trying to wait a week for an answer on these bathroom fans and you're just shut down um, you can't install anything you've got to go find other work to do and that could have a big schedule delay and so it's a very realistic experience as you're going through, but you can kind of see some of the different challenges that might happen when we're talking about change orders and how they get approved and through. Um, and you can see the process. Um, it's kind of similar to our RFI process that we talked about earlier in the semester, how it has to go through lots of different people to get answers. But then once the owner finally gets the price then they have to make the decision is this how we want to proceed now if the owner decides to proceed then the general contractor needs to make sure that as they've gone out um, and decided what they were going to do that they're going to get all of the correct pricing so if we go back to this here, the general contractor sends the RFI to the architect. The architect asks the owner, then the owner says, let's figure out a solution. So then the architect comes back here. The architect needs to go to their consultant. And then they get that back from their consultant. Then the architect sends, the proposal re proposal request to the general contractor so then what does the general contractor do when they get that proposal request well they're going to send that back to all of their subs So any subs that would be affected by the proposal request, you need to make sure that it goes out to those subcontractors. If you don't know, then you send it out to everyone. Now, don't overwhelm your subs sending out every single thing. So if the architect says, um, we need paint, or we're just changing the paint color, then you don't need to send that proposal request to your site contractor or to your plumber um, or to your electrician. If it's just changing the paint color, then you know, okay, that's going to affect my painter. So be smart about who you send it to, but also if you don't know 
then make sure that you send it out to all of your different subcontractors because you want to get the pricing back from all of your subcontractors. You might say, well, I don't know that this is going to affect this subcontractor, but you don't want them coming back later after you've already gotten approved change order from the owner and say, hey, well, we've actually got $5,000 worth of work on this. And then you as a general contractor don't get to get paid for that work. You can't go in after the fact to the owner and say, well, I know we gave you this price for the change order, but we forgot to send it to the Mason and they actually had a lot of work. Um, you're going to have to eat that as a general contractor. And so what I would do as a project manager is I would send out my change orders or my proposal request to all the different subcontractors that I knew that it was going to affect or that I thought it might affect. And I would ask them for their pricing. So the subs go, they come up with their pricing, and then they send it back. Now we'll go this way. To send it back to the GC, okay? And they put up all their markups. And so all of these prices go into that change order. So then you've got your general contractor who evaluates the change order. They look to make sure that it's legitimate pricing from the subcontractor and they go through and check it because sometimes subs might not have legitimate costs and it should have already been included but they're just trying to make money so as a general contractor you're sometimes being really critical of these change order costs that come in and so you get your um, amount from all your subcontractors you add it all up and you add up any costs and time that you might have so if it's going to cause a delay in the project you make sure that you put that in there because that could affect your liquidated damages down the road and so you're going to add those costs for your change orders and then you send that to the architect and they are going to be very critical um, of the pricing because they're trying to protect the owner's price um, and their their budget as well and so you want to make sure that you've done gotten the, that pricing to them. And then the architect sends it to the owner and then the owner signs it and sends it to the GC. Okay, so you've got that and that's kind of your change order process. And then once your GC signs it, then your general contractor then sends it to your subcontractors. They send back the signed change orders to subcontractors telling the subcontractors that it's okay to proceed. Um, and so when you're compiling all those costs, just make sure that you're compiling everything. Um, overhead costs, tools, equipment, materials. You don't wanna leave anything out of change orders because once that change order is signed, you have agreed that that's the price that you're going to do it for. You can't come back and say, well, I know I gave you that price, but it's actually going to be this. You're on the hook for it. Um, so be very careful in that and make sure that you get all changes in writing. Um, if an owner's like, yeah, I want, I want you to move that door over there, make sure you get it in writing. Sometimes that's just an email follow-up, say, hey, to follow up on our conversation, I'm moving this door over here. Um, get it in writing because if it didn't write, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. And you'll look at a lot of owners that will forget. They'll say, well, I didn't tell you to do that. And you're like, uh, yes, you did. And they're like, oh, I don't remember that, especially when money's involved. Memories get really short. And so be careful not to accept any verbal change orders and don't let your subcontractors accept verbal change orders. Make sure that they are going through the change of chain of command and that the subcontractors know who is authorized to direct the work, um, direct them to do work. And so make sure that they know that. And then once it's signed by all parties, once the change orders are signed by all parties, um, then work can proceed. Now, one of the things that I would do when I was getting pricing from my subcontractors, sometimes you send out a proposal request to subcontractors and you don't hear anything back. 
Um, and even when you put in language like, hey, I need all pricing within 10 days, and then it's been 12 days and you still don't have any pricing and you know that it's going to affect their work, sometimes what I would do is I would send them a $0 change order for that proposal request um, and have them sign it so that they, if they don't have any costs associated with it, they have now signed away their right to come back and ask for cost. Um, that's just something that I did to kind of control costs and make sure that subs didn't come back later and try and claim money. And usually if you send them a $0 change order for a piece of work and they have to sign something, that will prompt them to action to say, well, well wait a minute, we do have costs. Well, I didn't get them from you, so let's see them. Um, and so sometimes it's just a way to get them moving and get the costs of accounted for so that you can get those change orders turned around in a timely manner for the owner. Um, so as you do that and you get it all signed, then work can proceed. Um, if it's rejected, sometimes you might have to adjust the amount. Sometimes they say, no, this is too expensive, or I don't think that these prices are okay. Um, so you can adjust your amount, you can try and lower it and say, well, we can take some off um, or change it, or you can hold firm on it. And the owner, you can have a disagreement with the owner and the owner says, do it anyways, but then that's when you have a claim. Um, so a claim is, is usually an unresolved change on the project or an unresolved change order. And so that's something that you wanna take into account. Now, the fee and overhead on a change order is usually specified again in the contract. Um, and so sometimes it might be 10%, um, which includes your overhead and profit. Um, for subcontractors, they might have a certain rate that they can charge in the contract. And so you wanna make sure that you're checking that and that you are submitting changes in accordance with how they want the change order process given. So you want to make sure that you're keeping a log of all your change orders. On bigger projects, this can be a huge thing. Um, just like the example story that Cougar shared, um, the project went from 240 million to 1.2 billion. Um, a lot of changes happened on that project. And so keep a log for you. Procore has a change order log that um, you can check to make sure that what the status of different change orders are, whether they're pending status or whether they're being reviewed or whether they've been accepted and changed the contract. And so you can look at that. Um, so make sure you've got some detailed descriptions with your change orders. Don't just put um, a price and then give it to the owner to sign there will be a lot of questions. Most owners want the backup. They want the subcontractor's proposal attached to the change order request. And so you need to provide as much backup as possible showing your costs that are justified to the owner. I know that I had an owner on a project and for the first six or eight months, he would scrutinize every single change order that went through. He would go through every sheet of backup and um, be looking for every single dollar of what was being spent before he would sign the change order. And so I got very good at providing all of the backup and answering all of his questions on any change order that came up. And so when that change order came up and I ended up working on a project with this owner for about three years, and after the first six to eight months, I would hand him a change order and he would just simply look at me and say, is this right? And I would say, yes, sir. And he would sign it with no questions after that um, because he knew that I had set the expectation of providing the backup that he needed um, in case there was any questions. And so I was always providing the backup of our subcontractor and supplier proposals, um, our costs that were associated, maybe our estimates that were on there. And so he had faith um, in the backup that I was providing him. And so once you establish that trust with your owners and have showed them that you're taking care of them and their money, 
um, usually this change order process can go pretty smooth. So you just have to make sure that you're building that trust. Now, there is a document on, um, pull this up here, document for formal change orders. And that is in your content section on Learning Suite. And if you go to your AIA documents, there is the, uh, actually, I'm going to have to look it up for you. It is the G, the AIA G701. So the G701 is the formal change order document for uh, the AIA projects. So most projects that you have, this will be the form that you will have that will get signed by the architect and the contractor and the owner. And so the G701, this is different than the A701, the A701, like we talked about, is the instructions to bidders. The G701 is our change order form. So it tells you the original contract sum, the net change by change orders, um, what the new contract sum is. And so you're just going through saying, this is what the contract amount changed by. Now, something that's important to note on a change order is what the markups will be. And so when we go to share screen, again, here in this whiteboard. So if I've got a $10,000 contract and I have a $1,000 change order, so $1,000 change order, Um, and that's the cost that I get from my subcontractor um, and my suppliers and everything. Now, I get a 10% markup on that. So the new contract amount would be 10000 or $11,100. Okay. So pretty easy on the additive change orders. When you add money to a project, you get your 10% markup on a project, okay? Now, if I had a $10,000 project and I have a negative $1,000 change order, what would be my new contract amount. Do I take off 10%? So would I have a 10% markup on there? So on negative change orders, you actually don't include any markup. So the new contract amount is $9,000, okay? So you don't give back fee on negative change orders, okay? So that's kind of hard for some people to recognize why that would be, but um, you just don't give back fee on a negative change order because usually on a commercial project, your fee might be 3%. And so if I have to, give 10% markup back on a thousand dollar change. I've just lowered my fee and I'm not making as much money on this project as I thought I was going to make. And so it doesn't make sense to give back the markup. You're just taking out of the contract um, the actual amount that's going. And so you don't get any, or you don't lose additional fee. And so if let's say, on this, of this $10,000, uh, 
um, our fee was 3%. So let's say $10,000. So 3% of that would be $300, All right? So C on the 10,000 would be $300. Now on our new fee or our new contract, whoops. So now on our new contract amount, 900 or our fee would still be $300. So now our fee is actually, our new fee is 3.3% instead of just a normal 3%. So if our fee over here was 3% at $300, um, and then they subtracted $1,000, our new contract amount is $9,000. Our fee is going to remain the same. So our fee actually went up when they raised or when they took out part of the project. And, and that's okay because I went into the project thinking I was going to get $10,000. I decided I was going to build the project. I was only going to do it if I was going to get 3% of $10,000. Now that you've taken money out, maybe if they decided to take out half the project and it was a $5,000 contract, then I wouldn't want to do the project for only $150. It wouldn't be worth my time. And so you don't have to give back fee on your change orders. Okay. So hopefully that helps you understand um, some change orders and kind of the process of change orders. You're going to have a change order assignment that helps you um, understand this a little bit more. And I'm going to show you here um, kind of what you're dealing with. And so part of it is here in Bluebeam. Okay, so in Bluebeam, there's a function called overlay to where you can compare two different drawings and see what changed. Because sometimes you're gonna get drawings from architects in regards to change orders, and they'll send you a new sheet. And most of the time they will have on their sheet, it might have something clouded, right? They might say, change this window. Um, and that would help you know that, hey, that's where a change was and that's what you're looking for. But sometimes architects don't always do that. Sometimes they forget or sometimes they just leave it out and expect you to find the change and you're held accountable for it anyways, even if it's not clouded. And so we don't always like that. And so Bluebeam's um, overlay feature is a really nice thing to be able to look at. And so when we go to document and we go overlay pages. So I've got my two different documents here and I'm gonna cancel that. I'm gonna show you the two different documents. So this is the RFI assignment, GA1 first floor plan. So this is our original plan. And then the change order assignment sheet gives us this plan. And it looks very similar, but if you look at them going back and forth, you'll notice a few things. This one has all these lights on here. Um, and this one doesn't have any of those lights and it doesn't have a desk there like there is on this one. So there's definitely some changes. And so to be able to see what those changes are, I open both of these in my Bluebeam, and then I take my document and I go to overlay pages. And you might need to change these colors if you're colorblind. Um, this is red and this is green. And so if those 
affect you in your color blindness. You might need to change those colors so you can see what changes. But I'm going to leave them there for now, and then I'm just going to hit OK. OK, so now I've got some changes that have happened here. OK, so anything in red has been removed and anything in green has been added, okay? So all of these lights have been added. Um, this desk has been added. This wall here has been removed. Um, so this creates a whole new sheet. So I can go back and still look at my other sheet. So in the first plan, this wall was here. In the second plan, this wall has been removed. And in my overlay plan, I can see that this red wall has been removed, so that's gone. Okay, I've also, these two green mechanical units have been added. Um, this sink has been taken away in both the men's and the women's restroom. And then what it's showing here is a toilet has been removed and another urinal has been added. And then you're seeing this toilet partition here. Toilet partition has been removed and you've added a urinal screen, okay? So you're looking at these different things that have been added and subtracted. And so you are going to go and do a change order based on the change order assignment instructions that I've given you, but you're gonna use this plan. So you might say, oh, this green wall is new, so they've added this much wall. Well, I've given you a price for how much walls cost um, to frame and to finish and paint and everything else. So you're going to be looking at those items and you're gonna say, oh, how much does it cost to take away two sinks? How much does it cost to add a urinal instead of a toilet? Um, so you're going to look through and make sure that you've looked at all of the changes on this overlay document, and then you will go to your change order assignment over here. Um, I give you the scenario, I've given you the pricing, and you are going to come up with a change order cost um, of how much it's going to be. So you're going to go through and then you'll create a change order in Procore and you will turn in a change order for this assignment. Okay, so you'll kind of have the experience of getting a change order and estimating your way through it and then turning it in um, as a change there. So, um, that's kind of our main gist of our um, change order lecture. Um, hopefully you kind of understand the process of how when changes do occur on a project, where they go, um, it's got to follow the line of command. It's got to go through the general contractor, to the architect, through the owner, it has to get approved um, based on the pricing. And you want to make sure that you've got all of your pricing in there because that's your one shot of getting the cost uh, paid for. Because once you sign that change order, that's just like signing a lump sum bid saying, yep, this is the cost that it's going to be. This is what I'm going to charge you. This is what you're going to pay. And so if you have costs that you forgot to put in there, you get to eat those costs. Um, and so be careful with that, but also don't just look at it as an opportunity to make um, unfair profits on your owner. Always remember that you're trying to build these relationships with owners and the owners probably are gonna have another project and so you need to make sure that you're treating them fairly. You wanna make sure you're getting paid for your work, but you wanna make sure that you're treating your owner fairly um, and going through. And sometimes owners, um, will expect you to eat a lot of change orders. And sometimes 
you know, I know some owners where they're like, if it's less than 500 bucks, I don't even want to see it. Um, just figure out a way to do it. Um, because especially if it's on a $30 million project, then they're going to think you're nickel and diming them if you're just turning in $300, $500 change orders. Um, but you got to be careful that you don't just keep eating all of those because um, you will end up losing money if you eat them all. But sometimes you make that decision to where you say, um, uh, how are you going to get things paid for? Um, where you say, oh, I'm going to make a decision and say, well, yeah, this is $3,000. I think it's a legitimate change order, but the owner doesn't. And, you know, you work with your company executives to say, do we eat this one? Because we want to keep them happy and they have another $30 million job that's bidding next year and we want to be their contractor of choice. Sometimes you make that decision. Um, but change orders can become a point of contention um, and it can be something that you really need to manage on a project because they can get out of control really quickly. If you have any questions, please reach out and call me. Um, I can try and explain any part of this lecture more in more detail if you need and um, hopefully you've got enough information to work on your change order assignment. If you have questions on the homework, again, please call me. Uh, and we only have a few lectures left. Um, I think we have billing and then kind of some closeout and project reviews and then an organizational project management and then one other. So uh, we're getting close to the end of the semester. Hopefully all of your other classes are going well. Um, and that you're dealing with your quarantine and shut down the best that you can. Um, I miss having you guys in class. I hope things are going well and we'll see you in the next lecture.